Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Nordic Football Podcast Swedish Alsvenskan Season Preview 2019. I'm Steve Wiss, and I'm joined by our expert in Sweden, Jonathan Fadugba. You must be excited for the start of uh, the Alsvenskan, mate. Hi, Steve, and hi to all the listeners. Uh, welcome to the show, the 2019 Nordic Football Podcast Season Preview for Sweden's Alsvenskan. We've had part one, which was the Elita Serien, um, and we do, I guess we're doing it in alphabetical order, N, and now we're on to S, and it's Sweden, and I am absolutely buzzing. Cannot wait. Been ready for this show, been waiting for the new season. Uh, I'm really, really excited. Let's do this, Steve. We're like a London bus, aren't we? We don't do a podcast for a while, and then two in the space of three days. Uh, yeah, I'm excited about this one as well. So, um, well, let's just talk about the Asfrenskin as a whole. In general, we had this little bit of conversation prior to the uh, Norway um, podcast, and it's very similar, the numbers, in terms of transfers. Uh, 8.1 million euros have been uh, received by clubs, uh, but uh, only 2.3 million has been spent. So there's a talent drain of about roughly 6 to 7 million euros. And, uh, you know... I always, in my mind, perceive the Swedish league to be a little bit above the Norwegian league, John. But looking at these numbers, perhaps there's, it's much more equal footing now um, in terms of quality. Is this a league that's losing it a bit in that department as well? It's difficult to say. I think I think Sweden's always been a bit of a unique league in the sense that you, you do tend to get fluctuations. Um one of the things I've noticed about the league is you tend to get players who break out, who do really, really well. Uh, you think they're going to go on to unbelievable things. And then next thing you know, six months later, they're back in the Svenska uh, on loan or, you know, having not performed maybe to the expectation abroad. So I think it's one of those leagues that tends to fluctuate. I think, I think players tend to gravitate towards their homeland. Um, I think a good example of this maybe is, is maybe a bit of an abstract example but uh, Pontus Janssen I think at Leeds um, is like a huge Malmo fan you know he's always talking about Malmo he was at the Chelsea the Malmo Europa League game leading the, leading the fans um, and you know they just have maybe that have that homeland feeling where they, they do gravitate towards home I think at times so that makes the league's quality tend to fluctuate it wouldn't surprise me uh, you know we're going to talk about transfers in a minute but it wouldn't surprise me if some of the players who have maybe left the league uh, or some of the players who maybe you know, have gone to bigger things. It would not surprise me if this time in June or July we're talking about them uh, being back in the league again. So it's one of those kind of leagues, and there's a few players that like that that we'll come on to who have already returned. It's one of those sort of leagues, I think. Uh, 450,000 euros is the highest transfer fee paid so far for a player, which is quite low, really. Although one thing I have noticed is quite a lot of players have come into the league who have what I would call a high market value, but not necessarily clubs either paying any money for him at all or uh, or coming on loan. Um, I mean, in terms of transfers out, there was a big, the biggest one is uh, from AIK, Christopher Olsen, four and a half million to Krasnodar. But uh, as I say, by and large, not uh, a lot of money being spent here and there. Attendances in the league uh, have been on the downer. Just uh, five teams uh, had an increase in attendances last year. Um, and uh, they were Hammerby, AIK, Ostersunds, Norshipping, Slightly and Hacken. Uh, really big reductions from Malmo and Njurgarten, I suppose. But that's to do with performances on the field as well. But uh, do you feel the fans are deser deserting the league, uh, John? Or is this another case of fluctuations year on year? I think it's fluctuations, Steve. I think there are some statistics to suggest that actually the league is gaining in popular popularity in some areas. Um, I think one thing to actually note about Swedish football in general is I think the women's game is, is really thriving and doing well. Uh, Sweden have a very good women's team, as, as, as we know. And one example of that is that on the front cover of this year's um, season preview, the sort of main national papers uh, preview, main national magazine, uh, there's a, you know the front page is a, is a Swedish female and male player, um, you know, given equal footing, and that that tells you a little bit about the kind of um, the, you know the the focus that women's football has in Sweden. I think obviously it's always um, fighting a battle for supremacy, even in, in its own land football in Sweden. Um, you have 
things like ice hockey, are, you know, popular sports as well. There's other sports in Sweden that are very popular um, and football's fighting that battle. I think what tends to maybe, I always wonder why the, the summer break is so long in Sweden. I mean, I, I get it in some ways, but I think that fo the football, you know, once it gets cold, it, it's pretty damn cold at times in Sweden, you know, when it gets to the winter months. Um, and I wonder sometimes, does that affect fans? I'll give you an example from last season. Gif Sundsvall, um, players, uh, sorry, there were about seven, 70 fans roughly in this one game in the stands, uh, Gif Sundsvall game. And they were actually so bored of the match, they started sledging down the snow in the stand. Uh, it was a snow-covered stand and the fans started sledding down it. You know, that's that gives you a little bit of insight into maybe their attention span in that game. And um, sometimes I wonder, you know, does the weather help? Uh, I've been to games myself where, it, honestly, it's absolutely freezing and your biggest what. Your biggest thought is really let's let's get to let's get out of here and get to a warm, nice uh, living room. So um, you know, I wonder if they could play a bit longer in the summer months when it's nicer and warmer and and, and a bit, bit better conditions. But uh, all in all, I think the league has retained its popularity. But it's about how do we build it, Steve? You know, I mean, I'd like to see it improve to be honest and having tendencies get even bigger. And that a lot often depends on the quality and the excitement. And I do think actually looking at the league this season, there is going to be a lot of excitement that is good to hear uh very good to hear indeed well let's not mess around let's get straight into these uh, team previews and uh it's a brief rundown on this league in the last few years uh malmo they've won four of the last six titles but it is aik who are the defending champions um for 2019 who are you predicting to win this league job well, we're going straight into number one, are we? Or are we going to talk about the Champions AIK first? Well, I'll leave it up to you. You can talk about the your prediction or you can go with AIK, whatever you want. Okay. Well, I think I'm going to begin with my wild card here. And I'm going to stick my neck out. And anyone who's a regular listener, and by the way, if you don't know anything about us, then go to the last podcast and listen to the first six minutes because... Uh, we talk all about ourselves then and, and tell you a bit about our backgrounds. But uh, anyone who's been a, a regular listener of this show will know that I'm a bit of a fence sitter at times. I don't like... Yes, you bloody are. <laughs> I don't like to stick my neck out on the line too often. And, uh, you know, I know Steve likes a, a bold prediction there, but I tend to try and sort of stay neutral. But this time and this season, I think it's time for me to, you know, get a bit more brave. And I'm going to do that by making my prediction, which may rile up some fans. I am actually predicting that Noor Shopping are going to be number one in this table. Uh, I'm predicting Noor Shopping is champion in Sweden this season. Well, I have to say that is uh, very much a move, showing that you've got plenty of bollocks with that uh, prediction. John, not exactly a shocker as such, but I don't think too many would uh, have them as uh, champions. What do you see in this uh, team? Uh, bear in mind, they were second last year, actually. They uh, took the title fight right to the last game of the season. Um, what do you see them um, in this squad that they can go the extra distance this time around? Yeah, I've got several reasons for this. And, you know, we'll come to the other teams shortly as well. Um, maybe it's a case of backing North Shopping as, and then also maybe having question marks maybe about two, one or two other teams that make me wonder about their ability to maybe retain or, 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 or challenge for this title. Um, so, yeah, I mean, looking at North Shopping... You know, the first thing to note is they actually have a great track record in general. You know, they've won the league 13 times in the past. They are a massive team in, in Sweden in general. Uh, haven't won the league since 2015. But, um, you know, I, I just think they have a solid outlook for this season. And I'm, I'm just going to be brave and say I'm going to go for them. A couple of reasons for this. Um, where to begin? I, I think they have really, really good options throughout the whole squad. I think we talked about Mulder a little bit in the last podcast and, and I see some similarities in, in the sense that I see strength and depth in several areas for uh, Noor Shopping. I think they have good firepower. Uh, I think if you look at the likes of Kalle Holmberg, uh, he's a one in two goal scorer, solidly, you know, 40 goals in 80 games, I think, over his time uh, at the club. Uh, I think you've got emerging talents like Seaman Scrab, who got seven goals in 29. Uh, games last season, you know, he's improving. He's not always been that great, but just showing signs, he's still relatively young. Um, you've got the likes of Neiman, who's come in now. He's a bit of a club legend. Uh, you know, he's a, he's a sort of Marcus Rosenborg to Malmo type player where, you know, he's an emblem of the club. 
he will be looked upon as someone who can carry the can and you know has that passion for the team. Um, I just think they've got a lot of good players, to be honest. I think they've got a good production line. Uh, so I look at players like one of the what I think is one of the best signings of the of the window so far in, in the Osvenc game, uh, which is Sead Haksabanovic coming back from West Ham. I'll come on to him in a second, Steve, because I'd like to discuss him a little bit. But uh, I think he's a really good signing. I think Jordan Larson. I expect bigger things from him this season. The son of Henrik Larson. I think he's going to help uh, add to that production line. I think they're solid at the back. I think they've retained most of the talent. They've lost a couple of players, but I think they're still solid. I like their manager. I think he's a good age. And I just think if you actually look at last season, AIK should have won the title with like five, six games to spare. But these guys at North Shopping, uh, Peking did not give in. Uh, they won eight of their last 10 games um, towards the end of the season. They only lost three games all season, uh, actually, in fact, and didn't lose um, from July till the end of the season. So they already have this good run. They won their last five games straight. I just like what I see from North Shopping. And I think if they can retain that momentum and stay injury free, they've got a really good chance this season. Uh, North Shipping had the very best home record in the Arsvenskan last season. Uh, they won 12 out of 15 games, two draws and just one defeat. Uh, is it a typical sort of fortress uh, then, John, there? I mean, is that just a bit of an anomaly or have they always been really, really strong at home? Well, they're a well-supported club, so, you know, that's that's no surprise to me. They, they've got good fans. Um, they've got a nice culture about them, the club. They tend to go under the radar a little bit because, obviously, you have the big boys like AIK, Malmo, uh, and then the Stockholm teams like uh, Jurgard and Hammerby, who are maybe you could argue they're, they're bigger um, than North Shopping. But North Shopping are a team who, are, like I say, they've, they've won the league several times. They, they've got a good history. Um, and I just think that, you know, that, you know their home form, like you said, they, they, they had solid home form. They only lost one game at home last season. That was against Trelleborg, which was a, a massive surprise early on in the season. But I just think they're, I think they've got a lot going for them. And I think... Um, I see them as a, a big title challenger. Uh, just looking at their transfer dealings, they, uh, they've they made a profit this uh, winter. They sold David Moberg Carlson for £1.6 million to Sparta Prague. Ten goals and six assists he got. But coming in, two names I want to talk to you about here. Christopher Nyman from Eintracht uh, Braunschweig, I think that's pronounced, um, uh, for 450000 and also Saeed Haskabanovic. Uh, you just mentioned him uh, on loan from West Ham. Uh, two players that I'm interested to hear your opinions about. Well, yeah, I want to talk about David Mobo Carlson, uh, as you've mentioned there. Um, I think that's a big loss for them. Uh, he was he seemed to carry the can towards the end of last season. I remember uh, a game towards the end of the campaign, in fact, uh, against, I think it was, Orebro, uh, where he was outstanding. Uh, they won 3-2. He scored twice. I, I think he was... Towards the end of the season, really, really good. And he's, he's fully deserving of his move to Sparta Prague. And in fact, he's already gone there and got two two assists and one goal in five games in the Czech League. So it looks like they're, you know, he's, he's picked up where he's left off. Um, as you said, yeah, he got 10 goals and six assists in 29 games. But I look at it and I think to myself, all right, they're going to miss him and they will miss him because he is a good player. But if they can, you know, if Haksabanovic and Jordan Larson can sort of pick up five goals and five assists each, that pretty much makes up for his loss. And I see no reason why uh, Jordan Larson and, and Max Vandermich can't do that. Um, I expect big things from Jordan Larson this season. I don't think he really had a good season last year, but I think he has ability. Um, and as I say about Max Vandermich, he was a breakout star at Halmstad before he earned his move to West Ham United. Didn't work out for him there. I've heard a lot of uh, stories behind the scenes about Max Vandermich that he was a bit too much uh, enjoyed the bright lights of the uh, big city in, in London and maybe got a little bit distracted in terms of training. I heard sort of rumours and I don't know if they're, they're not verified. I don't know him personally, but uh, I had quite you know, solid reports that he was out partying and things like that. And uh, maybe the likes of Andy Carroll and um, you know others at West Ham weren't the best influence on him. But he's come back now and I'm hoping he can focus and knuckle down because I think he should be capable of five goals, five assists minimum. And I just think that momentum could really, really benefit North Shopping. I also think, by the way, that um, the signing of Casper Larson in defence um, is another one who could be could be good for them. And you mentioned Neiman. Like I said, he's an iconic figure at the club. He's the one who you know will be a sort of spiritual leader potentially. Uh, and so I just look at I just look at them and I like what I see. And I think if they carry that momentum, 
um, then they've got a really, really good chance this season. OK, a bold prediction there in North Shipping to win the title. Uh, in terms of closest challenges then, um, I mean, do you see it being a tight uh, title race? Who do you think is most likely to challenge them uh, for this title? Well, yeah, just before we move on, I think, I think, um, like I said, Jens Gustafsson is a really, really good manager at this level. I think he will do well. I think Alexander Franson is one of the best uh, midfield players in the league. I think he, he is, um, he blends defence and attack, and I think he can become a bit more of a leader this year. Uh, and I think Isaac Pettersson in goal, uh, a young goalkeeper from North Shopping, he's uh, 21 years old. I think he's a fantastic goalkeeper, actually, and I think he's got an argument to be the best goalkeeper in this league this season. And so, like I say, Steve, I look at all that and I just, you add it up together. Uh, like I say, Neiman is the captain and, the, you know, potentially um, you know, the, the spiritual leader, like I say. You add all those things together, the goalkeeper, the defence, the midfield uh, with Franson in there and then the supply line and then the strike force. Uh, they look really, really strong. Okay, well, the bookmakers' favourites to win this league are Malmo. And, uh, well, it's no real surprise, is it? They've won four of the last six titles. Uh, but you don't think they're going to win it this year. However, you do predict them second. So I'm guessing you suspect that they will be a strong, strong contender. I do indeed. I look at Malmo and I think, um, I think they've got a lot to do, maybe. I think they I kind of, I mean, the reason I don't have them as champions, I base it on a couple of things. I mean, Firstly, let's look at the positive side for them. You know, they only lost one of their last 20 games last season. Um, since Uwe Rosler came in, they've been really good. <clears throat> like I say, only lost one of 20. And when you compare it to the beginning of their season last season, they lost five games in, their last, in the first 10 of the season. So they lost 50% of their first 10 games, which is unbelievable for a, such a solid team like Malmo. Um, so you'd look at Uwe Rosler and you think to yourself, well... Those um, results imply that perhaps this is their year in terms of, you know, maybe they'll carry that momentum on. But I just look at two two games that I've seen recently of, of them, and I know you can't read too much into it in the early part of the season, but I just two games I want to highlight is, uh, number one, that were quite instructive. These games were quite instructive for me. Number one, the Chelsea game uh, at Stamford Bridge. And the other game was in the, in the, in the cup against Osters, who they were knocked out by. Um, they were knocked out early in the cup. I just look at them and I think to myself, um, do they have the sort of creativity? Do they have that flair? Do they have that spark? Uh, I, I really expect big things from Romain Gaul. I think he's got the ability to be one of the best players in the league this season. I think we could be looking at him as one who might even be uh, off in, in, the win in, the, in the window in, in the summer. Uh, an American player who's got real quality, but him aside, I, I just look at the squad and I, I wonder sometimes where, where are the, where's the creativity, where are the spark, where's the goals coming from? They're a very solid team. They'll play a solid sort of formation. You know, they may well even end up in a 5-3-2. They've played that in a couple of games um, in the cup uh, and in pre-season. But Carlos Strandberg, I didn't think he had a fantastic impact last year. I, I do wonder about his ceiling, um, the striker, a uh, young striker who's played for Sweden under 21s, but He's getting slightly on a bit now. He's into his early to mid twenties. Um, Marcus Antonsson is always going to be a reliable player, of course. But you look at Christiansen, you've got Bachiru, but I just, you know, the wing backs are okay. But they're, you know, I just wonder if they're a bit much of a muchness. Um, Malmo. I, I like the fact that they've brought back Erdi Racket, who is one that, as I mentioned earlier, about players coming back to the league. Uh, he's one who's come from Ben. He was sold to Benfica, and he spent some time at Crystal Palace randomly. Uh, and has now returned to Malmo. I think he'll 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 add some creativity and some spark. But I just question their general. You know, they have enough pace. Do they have enough excitement in their team? I think they maybe lack one or two sort of marquee names just to really convince me that they could win this title. Yeah, looking at their transfer dealings, they're one of the few clubs that have actually spent more than they've sold. In fact, they've not received any income from transfers this winter. They obviously are a club that uh, don't need the, uh, the finances in that regard. Um, they did spend 500000 on Erdl Racket, as you mentioned. Uh, there's a player I do want to talk about. I uh, watched him all of last year in MLS, Joe Inger Birgit. Uh, what do you make of this player, John? Because uh, I've got a few things to say about him uh, not too pleasantly. 
Uh, well, what do you have to say about him? Let's ask you. Well, I've got to be honest. I mean, I watched him in MLS last year, and as you know, that league is full of goals, full of chances and goals. And um, just be honest, I've got to be honest. I just don't think his composure was very good. Um, the opportunities were there, but he always seemed to fluff his lines a lot. You know, looked a bit very clumsy, like, and uh, you know that perhaps. He was a bit unlucky to be playing at New York City because their home great matches are played at a baseball stadium for crying out loud. Loud and the the, the surface can be a bit crap sometimes. But uh, maybe he was a bit homesick as well. I don't know. But I wasn't impressed with what I saw. There was he came with uh, quite a strong high reputation. So you know he's another one of these players going back home to Sweden. I mean this is like a theme, isn't it? I noticed this with a lot of transfers. Uh, maybe he he'll perform better on home turf, but. Um, I wasn't that impressed with him in, in, in MLS, in a league where he, he would have got an awful lot more chances than he's going to get in the house of Enskin, you know? Certainly, yeah. Uh, interesting to get your opinion there. I think, I think, I mean, he's one who will be fighting for his place uh, in the squad. I don't, he's not guaranteed to get in the, in the first team, I don't think, by any means. And, uh, you've got, like I say, Strandberg there. You've got Antonsen. You've also got Marcus Rosenborg, who will, you know, is a reliable, solid sort of figure. He's obviously experienced. Um, and will tend to get probably selected more often than not. Birgit will have a challenge to get back into the team, I think. Um, and he's won a bit similar to Pavel Sabitsky, who went to Leeds and didn't really make it and came back. Uh, he's now at Elfborg. Um, yeah, so I don't think, you know, Birgit is really here or there, to be honest, in terms of influencing them in the title race. I just like I say, I think they just, you know, they may well sign someone before this end of the window, but... You know, I think they lack a bit of a spark. And but the, the the thing that makes me sort of maybe positive on Malmo is the fact that I think in the summer they're the t- sort of team that could go and spend and get some attract some big names and then push on from there. You know, if you look at Malmo, they're they're a massive club. They have a massive fan base. Um, they will be able to attract the best players coming back to Sweden or you know the best players in the league uh, in the early parts of the year, like they did with Romain Gol, who they signed from Gif Sundsvall. So. That's the thing with this sort of team. They've, they've got that pulling power. And if they use it in the summer, then you can't write them off. But I just look at their current score and I think, you know, is it as good as North Shopping's? Hard to say. Um, and so I, I look at them as second place. Just before we move on to the next team, I just want to have a, just a quick talk about Uwe Rosler because... Um, I mean, I've noticed that he averages 2.39 points per game in the Alsvenskan since taking charge of, of Malmo. Uh, if that was done over the course of a whole season, that would get them nearly 72 points, which would almost certainly win them the league. Obviously, these I've seen these sort of things before, and it's a team over a calendar year, you know, does this. It's about doing it from April till November, of course. In terms of the two managers, then, North Shipping uh, against... Um, Malmo, I mean, we've got two different styles here. You mentioned, I mean, Russ is a little bit more conservative, yes? Slightly more conservative, but he, he tends to vary his tactics at times. He can play different formations. Uh, Gustafsson tends to like to stick to, you know, what he knows. Um, I don't think there's too much in, be- in between them, really, to be honest. I think russell has got the different experiences he's, he's managed in England. But, um, you know, they're... He, like I said, Ross has done very well since he went there. And at one point last season, I thought they might actually go on a run and perhaps challenge for the title. But uh, they didn't quite do it. Uh, like I said, Gustafsson has caught his record last season. You know, They really picked up form after the summer. In fact, throughout the whole year, they were consistent. You know, they, they, They're a bit of an underrated team, I think. And uh, what, was, what did you say their odds were to win the title? They're like third or fourth favourites. I think there's good value there. North Shipping are about six to one, seven to one in general. So a bit of value there. Uh, compared to Malmo, about even money. Yeah. So, yeah, let's move on to the um, the champions then, AIK. And, uh, well, they won the league, but they certainly didn't win um, any awards in terms of excitement. Uh, in fact, only one other side in the division, that was Kalmar, uh, were involved in matches that contained less goals on average. Uh, and if you were an over 2.5 goal backer in a in an AIK game, you were going to the poorhouse because uh, only seven of their 30 contain more than two goals in them. We, we know how they won the league, John, with a brilliant defensive record. And uh, I guess the big question is, is that sustainable um, this time around? Yeah, you've hit the nail on the head there. And uh, actually, just to maybe back up my point slightly more, 
uh, a little bit of an interesting statistic for you here. There's only one team in the league that beat them last season. Can you guess who it is? Oh, I know this. Oh, I remember you mentioning it on the pod last year. I think it was either Hacken or Norshipping. I can't remember which one. You got that right there. Snore shopping, Steve. Uh, so, you know, maybe that backs up my point again. They're the only team who beat ARK last season, a 2 0 win in September. So, yes, but looking at ARK, you're correct. You bang on. They won the league based on their defence. And I've got them in third place. Um, I think Malmo and ARK, you could flip a coin. I could see ARK easily finishing second. And to be honest, they could easily win the league again. You know, I'm not, I'm not saying they're not going to win the league, but. Um, I have them just down in the third because I think my Malmo have got that more greater experience maybe in terms of just doing it year in, year out. I struggle to see them finishing third. Um, my issues with AIK, I would say they, I think they've lost some key players. Uh, Robin Janssen, obviously, if you look at their defence, they've lost Robin Janssen, who started 25 games for them last season. He's gone to MLS. Uh, and then they've lost another player who I thought was fantastic last season, uh, Alexander Milosevic, who um, has gone to Nottingham Forest. We actually wrote a, I wrote an article about them for a Nottingham Forest uh, website, uh, in a UK website, and funnily enough, the um, <clears throat> the editor of that website got in contact with me after like three or four games and said, listen, this Milosevic is quality. I've, I've heard really good reports from Forest fans. They really seem to like him. And it's a shame that AIK lost him on a free transfer, to be honest, because they could have at least made some money out of it. But it's a no-brainer for a championship side picking him up. Um, so they've lost those two in defence. And we have to bear in mind as well, they've probably lost the best player in Sweden last season, arguably. Um, certainly probably the best midfielder. And that's Christopher Olsen, who's um, gone to Krasnodar in, in Russia. He's gone there for a fee of four million pounds, which is a really big, uh, really big move. Um, so when you look at it, they've, you know, and he's a, he's a, he was a real like, talisman for them. You know, he's a good playmaker, plays through the Lions. He's intelligent, sort of uh, central midfielder. So I really worry about those three players they've lost in particular. Um, on the positive side, I do like Carol Metz, um, the centre-back who they've signed. Uh, he's left side of the centre-back, he, and he's come from the Eredivisie. Um, he's a very good distributor of the ball. I like him, you know, he's a left-footed defender who can sort of bring the ball out. Um, I think he's good. He's a composed defender, so I think he'll do well in this, in this league. But I can't see them conceding 16 goals again, like what, you know, less, almost less. Well, averaging you know one every two games conceded, I just think they it'd be very hard to maintain that sort of unbelievable record. Uh, I'd be amazed if that happens again. So I, my question is: Is their defence strong enough? And then the knock-on effect of that is their attack strong enough? Yeah, I'm familiar with Carol Metz. He was an ex Viking player up in Norway, and I've noticed they've signed two players from the Elitis area: um, Daniel Granli and Magnar Odegaard from Starbeck and Tromsø. Um, I've got to be honest. Um, they just—I wouldn't say they're anywhere near the level of the, the players that have left. Yeah, I mean, I mean, AIK have got good scouting in general. They've they've scouted well over the. I think that was key to their title win uh, this last season. I think they 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 really were smart in the transfer market and picked up some really good players like Milosevic. Um, but if you look at it, Steve, you, we talk about their attack there. You know, if I read off a list of they won they won the title obviously by two points. And they were fully deserved and they were a really good team and they were really well coached with some really good players. But, you know, Nor Shopping outscored them, Malmo outscored them, Hammerby outscored them, Hacken outscored them, Ostersons outscored them. And even Gif Sundsvall in eighth only scored three less goals than uh, AIK. So, you know, when if they receive any kind of dip in that defence, then I think, you know, looking at the signings uh, out front and losing uh, Olsen, do they have enough? to sort of um, make up for that. I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest. Yeah, it's a very interesting uh, point in there. I mean, there's, is there a chance that they could perhaps play more attacking and the guys could maybe step up uh, potentially? I don't know uh, there, John, but uh, I would, you know, if the defence doesn't hold up, where are the goals coming from? You've got them in third place, uh, which is still a fairly uh, decent, uh, respectable position. Uh, and they, of course, will be involved in the Champions League qualifiers. Uh, in the summer, so that could be a potential distraction going forward. Um, okay, well, outside the top three, then uh, are you going with uh, a, a side from Gothenburg, Gothenburg in fourth? But which one? <laughs> You're not going to catch me like last season. I think um, this season I'm not going to be 
getting that side of hissing and and, and Jotapur mixed up uh, this time. And you know, I've lived in hissing and I love the place. So to be honest, uh, it's, this team has a bit of a soft spot in my heart, and it's Big or Hacken. I'm gonna um, I'm gonna go for them in in fourth. I think that's one place up from last season when they were fifth. They've they've impressed in this Svenska Cup, the Swedish Cup so far this season. I think. I was a little bit down on them last season. I didn't really see much about them that, that, that made me um, excited. But you've got to look at it now and say to yourself, they're an established team now in El Svenskan. You know, they've just, bit by bit, they've just increased and increased and increased their sort of, um, their status in, in the league to the point now where they're kind of a solid top six side and I think they could even push top four. I look at them and I just think, you know, Okay, so if we take Paulinho, for example, he's a year older now, he's in his 30s. He was the league's top scorer by, you know, uh, a couple of goals last season. He got 20 goals in the league, which is was fantastic. And he's now their all-time top goal scorer in the Brazilian, uh, a dynamic player. But, you know, he's, he is starting to age a bit. And I remember the season before, he didn't have that great a season. And that was what put me down on him a little bit. And I just wonder, can he maintain that? I don't think he can maintain that, to be honest. I'd be amazed if he got another 20 goals and was top scorer. Uh, so... I look at that and there's a, maybe a bit of a downer, but I just think they're very well coached. I think the manager deserves credit. I didn't give them credit last season, but I think they deserve credit. They've, they've been guided to the uh, cup final now, and you would expect them to win that against AFC Eskil Stuna. Uh, I think that the likes of Dali Hoverindust is a fantastic player. Um, I've mentioned him before. He was one of my ones to watch last season. He's now actually been capped by Sweden. So that tells you all you need to know about the youngster. Um, I think he will continue to improve and, and attract interest. Uh, and then they've got the likes of Nasir and Mohammed. And, you know, one of the things they've got in their favour is the pitch. They've got a compact pitch. It's quite small. It's not a very big attendance. Um, you know, they tend to sort of play a pressing game. They tend to play fast-paced football. So I think it, it suits them going away from home as well. They can play counter-attack. And at home, they have such a compact field that with that winger system, they can get at teams. You know, they, they, they don't have to sort of have... Um, prolonged periods of possession. So I think they, you know, if, if you look at the league table, I think they've got a good chance. You know, they, they were the top scorers in the league last season. So um, you've got to factor that into. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned the ten attendances there. I noticed that they had the lowest average league attendance in 2017, which is pretty remarkable, just less than 3,000 per game. I mean, how do they keep managing to overachieve? I mean, this... On, the, on those sorts of statistics, you would think, oh, they're just a really small little club. I mean, IFK fans must be really pissed off that this small outfit from just across the city is constantly, well, in recent years, been uh, outlasting them a bit. And, uh, you know, they, they must be obviously very well run off the field, John. Yeah, well, I think there's two factors you can uh, put this down to for Bickle Hacken in terms of their development. And by the way, if you look through our archives, we've actually interviewed their sporting director, um, Sonny Carlson in the past, so you can get more insight in that pod if you, if you wanted to dig, dig into the archives. But uh, from my point of view, there's two key factors in their, um, their general kind of improvement over the years. Number one, they have a fantastic academy. Uh, if you look at players they've had from their academy in recent seasons, like I say, Dalejo Irundus is one, uh, and there are several others who have come through and emerged and either been sold or, or gone into their first team. I mean, one example recently was Kevin Ackerman, who went to Fiorentina. Um, there's been some sort of medical problems apparently there and the, apparently the transfer might not have even gone through and that's still kind of been a bit of a wrangle. But just in general, they, they have a really, really good academy. Um, and then the second point is the Gothia Cup, which is probably the biggest or one of the most famous youth tournaments in world football. Uh, every single year they have um, a massive uh, youth tournament. They have clubs from all over the world, literally uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of teams um, sort of descend on Gothenburg uh, this, and we're talking sort of like youth teams from, you know, under 18 to sort of under 10, under under 12. Uh, you know, they, they have teams from all over the world. And this has two benefits. Number one, it allows them to sort of scout players. So they tend to have signed a fair number of players actually from the Gothia Cup that they attract. Uh, and then also number two, it, it brings finances in for them. So their academy is actually called Gothia Park, for example. Um, and that tournament really brings in a lot of um, clout for for Hacken and that, that, that the finances have allowed them to sort of regenerate and if you take a look around the training ground and the facilities they're really really impressive um, and I, I, like you say of course probably do look at them a little bit and you know they wear yellow and black and you know they they do tend to sort of give a bit of a beasting to their neighbours these days so um, 
yeah, you know, they're a well-run club and, and they're a nice family club as well. It's the only team I've ever been to, the only ground I've ever been to where there's people playing FIFA uh, outside the concourse where you get your hot dogs. There's like kids, they have a kids area, they give free popcorn and uh, there's like kids sitting there playing FIFA. I couldn't believe it. But um, yeah, they have a nice family feel about the club. I do like them actually. Um, and going back to the sort of on the field, I think yeah, Jeremy Yef, Alexander Jeremy Yef, is a good player, 25, and I think he will he will get goals uh, again this season. Uh, former Malmo player, who you could say probably is maybe equal to or better than Joe Ingeberger. So he was a good move, a good good pickup. Uh, Ahmed Yassin, who had a good season previously. So, you know, I think one player to also look out for is Nigerian uh, Ekpolo, Kotswil Ekpolo. I think he will, he will do well in defence. Um, so, yeah, all in all, Steve, I, I like Beko Hakan and I think fourth is a, a solid shout for them. Fascinating uh, to hear about uh, Hakan there. Really fascinating stuff. Um, great club, it sounds uh, like, in that sort of way. Uh, let's move back to uh, Stockholm and... Uh, You've got in fifth and sixth place, uh, Hammerby and Jorgarten, respectively. Uh, Hammerby, oh, it was so cruel for them last year, wasn't it? They they were so close to making Europe. You almost feel like they, they deserved Europe, but they were pipped on the last game of the season. Um, you've got them fifth this year, which is a small down, well, small decrease um, for Hammerby. Do you think, I mean, end of the day, last year was a bit of a gut-wrencher for them at the end of the year, wasn't it? Can they recover from that? Well, we'll see. I mean, they conceded a lot of goals last season, 35, which is, you know, uh, even Calmar and Tent conceded that, that just as many as that. Uh, for a team that wants to challenge for the title, that's unacceptable. So the first thing they're going to have to do is, is sort out that, that defence. They had a bit of a stinger, like you say, because also the fact that uh, Eskil Stuna and ha Hakan are in the cup final means that they're European players. They could have qualified for Europe if um, I think AIK and a couple of the other teams who were already, who were already in Europe had won the cup. But the fact that uh, Hacken and AFC you know, are in the final means there's no Europe for Hammerby. So a double blow, uh, especially when you look at the fact that they were pipped on the last day of the season by Malmo to that, to that, uh, to that place in the league, that third place spot for Europe. So, yeah, it's not gone to too well for Hammerby and um, if you look at their transfers as well they've actually lost quite a few players uh, Bjorn Paulson, who I talked about a lot last season he's gone to the Bundesliga 2 uh, I think he'll be a really big loss I think he was their best defender um, their second best defender was probably Neto Borgs uh, the left back Brazilian who, who has gone on to uh, Belgium now he's been sold after one year they've also lost Kilo and Hamad who was who was quite solid for them last season and, and, and was productive in terms of his numbers of uh, assists and goals. And then they've also lost their, their legend uh, and one of the most famous scenes of last season's campaign was uh, the main man himself, the veteran Kennedy, who uh, scored an unbelievable free kick and ran off to the fans and someone chucked a full pint of beer onto the terraces. Kennedy caught it in his hands and actually took a drink from it. <laughs> <laughs> As you answer the corner flag, it's like you've got to watch it on YouTube. It's, you've never seen anything like it. It was like a sort of, um, you know, it was like watching sort of synchronized swimming, but beer drinking. <laughs> Where he just caught it in his full stride. Brilliant. Um, but he's retired and he's like a club legend. You know, he was in tears. They, they had like a celebration for him at the in the last game. Club legend. So I think they'll miss a bit of character this season. I think they'll miss a bit of quality. However. I do like some of their signings and uh, we'll come to some of them in a minute because we've got our 10 to watch for the season and anyone who likes fantasy fantasy football uh, might want to stick around for that 10 to watch because uh, we've got a few uh, fantasy team picks for that. But um, I like some of the signings. I'll, I'll just say that for now. Yeah, I mean, the, the big thing I notice about Hammer, Hammerby is there's a lot of signings in and out of the club. Um, I mean, we haven't got time to talk about all of them, of course, but uh, in terms of the general, you know, will it, is this a bit too unsettling? Is it too, is it too much action, both in and out of the, the door, John, to, uh, you know, bring a bit of instability? Well, you make a really good point there, Steve, because that's something about Hammerby that I don't like, tend to like. I think they have too much action sometimes. I never get the sense that they know where they're going in terms of the building their squad. 
it just always seems to me to be like one one year someone comes in then six months later they're gone then someone else comes in I, d I don't think they really build their squad for sort of two three years and that is always what makes me worry about having a little bit um you know if you look at it now they've they've they've, they've bought some good players but i look at them and i think to myself well you know will they be there i mean the perfect example of that Stephen. you know i don't want to sort of uh, um, give spoilers to my tend to watch for the season um, but if you look at their signing up front, Kiyati, he's only on loan. Um, and he is a really good player, and we'll talk about him later, but he's only on loan till, till, till the summer. So you look at it on one hand and think he's a quality player, but you look at it on the other hand and think, you know, is he going to be there in, in sort of August? So it's really hard to predict how he sometimes just because of that uh, massive churn of players. Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a difficult situation, that for sure. Um but, I mean, on the field, you see them in fifth place. I mean, are they a dark horse to be above that or do you see them just sort of locked in that sort of best of the rest sort of spot? I, I, really, I, really, thought, I really thought long and hard about who's going to finish higher out of your garden and Hammerby um, for sort of fifth and sixth. Um, I thought about it for quite a long time. And don't forget, like I say, you know, Hammerby are one of the best supported clubs. They've got a 32,000-seat arena. You know, they've got a lot going for them, Hammerby, if they can get it right. I know you like them as a, as a club in general. Um, they do recruit quite well, so it's, I'm not criticising the club's recruitment, but I just think it's a bit kind of, they tend to lose players quite easily. Uh, they don't seem to retain players for, for many, many years. So that's what I'm looking at, really. And I don't think they also integrate enough of their academy players um, well, and they have a good academy. So those are the things I, I kind of worry about. You know, they've got players like Zengin, who's left. So some of the players that we looked at last year and thought well they'll be good just just didn't make any impact. Um, but yeah, I mean they bought players. I like Dennis Woodgren, who's come from Ostersons. He'll be a good left back. He'll he'll do a good job. Um, Kaka Nikolic has come in. He, you know he's okay. Um, they've got two players I really like, but I'll save it for I'll yeah. save it for the to watch. Plenty to come later uh, with Hammerby there. Yes, and you're right. I do like Hammerby. Uh, they are probably, yeah, probably one of my favourite teams in this league, along with Ostersons now with the English connection there. Um, who's your favourite team in the Asvenskan, John, or are you completely neutral? I think I'm neutral to be honest. I can't really, I can't really, um, I'm going to go back on my fence for that one. I've, I've done enough to see, I've predicted the 7 to one outsider for the title, so I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going any further. I think, I mean, from, just from a personal point of view, I do I have been to a lot of stadiums in, in Sweden, but I haven't really, there's a lot of stadiums I haven't been to that will influence my ultimate decision, I, I think. I've not been to see Malmo, for example. Uh, I've not been to see Oiko, I've not been to see Hammerby, and I've not been to see Eurogarden. So, you know, that's four clubs that I'd like to go and see this season, to be honest, if I, if I can. Yeah, yeah, I didn't think I'd get a, uh, an exact answer there. So, uh... <laughs> Anyway, moving on to your garden, and uh, well, it was a bit of a, a mediocre campaign for them, wasn't it? 2018, seventh place uh, in the actual league, um, and you see them moving up slightly up the table, but not significantly. Not significantly. Um, they've got a new manager. They've got Kim Bergstrand and Thomas Lagerlöf. They've got two new managers, in fact. They've got a joint managerial situation going on. Uh, Oskar and Melka Mitchell, who I talked a lot about last season, he's, he's left. Didn't quite have the desired impact. In the end, they finished seventh. Um, bit of a strange club, to be honest. Like, they, they, they lacked goals, to be honest. Uh, you know, they, 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 they scored comfortably the lowest amount of goals in the, in the top eight, um, with only 40 scored and 30 played. It just never really seemed to get it together after 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 the early successes in, in the cup. Um, didn't really do, do enough. Uh, they had a spell of games where they sort of lost to Euro Hammerby at home, Malmo away, Bruno Poikin early in the season, and then just from then it, it never really seemed to pick up for them. Uh, Hacken smashed them five nil. It just seemed a bit of a weird season for Jurgen, to be honest. They have bought one player that I, I've talked about before, and I do really rate. Uh, he was a talent. He was one of our talent focuses at one point, Mohamed Bouyatoure, who I think is an outside bet for top goal scorer in the league, actually. Uh, and anyone playing fantasy football should should be looking at him maybe to integrate into their squad. I think he'll score goals. Uh, he's a sort of perfect player. He went to Belgium. It didn't work out for him in Belgium. I think he's got a bit of a questionable mentality at times. He, he was really critical of Belgium. 
uh, and he was really critical of, of other clubs in the past. So it's a bit of a weird situation. Um, maybe he doesn't get the rub of the green, but yeah, he, he's a solid player in the offense game and he'll go well for sure. He's the sort of player that, you you know, Geo Garden should be looking to sign and, and, and it was a good move. Um, but just all round, I'm not massively enthused by by their squad. I can't see them being too much higher than that. I mean, maybe top four, maybe fourth is, is as good as they make it, maybe can look. Um, but another thing about Geo Garden is they do tend to recruit fairly well. So, you know, come the summer, who knows? I suppose I better give my input here for your garden because they have signed, they've raided the Norway. Um, they've signed two players who I especially know well, uh, per Christian Brat, right, the goalkeeper from Hergesund. And he was on one of my 10 to watch last year in Norway. Um, I've always rated him as a goalkeeper. I don't know if goalkeeper was a, a really big need uh, to upgrade for your garden, but um, I would imagine he can actually do a pretty good job for them. Well, they needed a keeper, yeah, because Andreas Isaksen has retired. He's a bit of a legend, obviously, played for Ren. Um, so, yeah, they did need a keeper. And they, so they've gone in uh, also as like uh, from Wittry from uh, Ranheim and Elliot Kack from uh, Start. So, um, yeah, they have raided the Elitis area, in, which is interesting. Two uh, fullbacks there who got potential to. To boy, they're going from much smaller clubs to a bigger one here, so it'd be interesting to see how they develop. Um, obviously, they did lack goals, but I mean, they sold a lot of players um, who did score goals for them. I mean, Tino Cadawere went uh, didn't need to the half midway through last year. This Bargi's gone to uh, to Austria, sorry, Rapid Vienna. But obviously, Briatore is the big signing, isn't he? And uh, well, I like Ali Badge actually. I think that's a big loss as well. Uh, and I think if you if you couple if you look at their forward line sort of this time last year, uh, Ali Badge and Tino Cadawere were two players that were sort of stockpiled to maybe be their future future strikers. I mean they had other players in forward areas, but they were two who were sort of going to come through and emerge. And now both of them have left. So I think they will miss those players. Um, Cadawere as well, who was one of my ten to watch and got his move to to, to France. But yeah, I think I mean Elliot Kack's back, like you said. But they're just a sort of club. I, I just, I don't know how Kim Bergstrom will do at um, at your garden. Obviously, he was a serious. He did really well first season. Struggled second season. We'll talk about serious later. But um, I'm just not entirely enthused by by your garden, and I think they have a little bit of work to do in the markets. And I think it's. I think for them, it's about getting to the summer, just still being in that race. If they can get to the summer in the third, fourth, they can look again and go again, maybe with a couple of reinforcements. I just think their squad, as it stands, is lacking a little bit. All right, brilliant. So you've got to your garden down in sixth, uh, Hammerby fifth, Hacken fourth, AIK third, Malmo second, and Norshipping as predicted champions. We're going to take a little break right now, but join us uh, afterwards where we'll be discussing the rest of the league and John's 10 players to watch, plus a little bit of fantasy talk. So we'll see you in a little bit. Welcome back to the Nordic Football Podcast Swedish Allsvenskan Season Preview 2019. I'm Steve Wiss and I'm joined uh, with, by Jonathan for Dugba and we're halfway through our uh, season previews here. Next team we're going to talk about is Ossersons. Uh, you guys are predicting them for seventh place, uh, John. Um, aside very much with an English connection, previously with uh, Graham Potter and now Ian Birchnell. XVP has taken over at the helm. And a very friend of the uh, podcast, Sean Constable, is one of the assistant managers there. So, uh, Ossesson's in seventh place. John, and you see them going fairly well this year? Well, uh, not really, because obviously I've got them lower than last season. Um, they were sick last season, and I've got them slightly down. However, I think they can definitely challenge for the top four, so... I don't think there's any reason to suggest that they will certainly 100% finish seventh, but I think they have a bit of a battle to sort of maybe finish above. I could easily see them finishing above Hammerby and Yorgarden, but 
finishing above Hacken, Malmo, and North Shopping or I, I I struggle to see that happening. So I think the best they can aim for maybe is like fifth, between fifth and seventh. And I've just gone for your garden and Hammer B for reasons like I think they're slightly bigger clubs. I think they're slightly more established. And I just wonder about the sort of Graham Potter effect and how it will affect uh, Ostersunds in terms of can Ian Birchnell keep that uh, momentum going? Now, obviously, this is quite a difficult team to discuss it in, in, in a way because obviously we, we're good friends with Sean Constable. Um, we're good friends with Ian Birchnell. We've had them both on the, on the show before. Uh, and also, you know, I do like them in general. So it's, you know, you try and stay as balanced as you can. I mean, let's look at the facts with Ian Birchnell here. He's actually, um, his points per game has doubled since he joined uh, Ossesons compared to Viking, where we've had a really, really insightful show with him talking about his time at Viking, uh, which you can listen to in our archives. But yeah, he's he's played 19 at Ossesons and won 10. The thing with them is they're quite a streaky team under Birchnell at the moment. They're, they're the sort of team I think they'll be slightly inconsistent, and that's why I have them in that kind of seventh position. I think that, you know, if you look at last season, they went on a run of fours. So it was four straight wins, four straight defeats, four straight wins, uh, literally in 12 games. So they're an up and down side. I think they're still finding a little bit of identity in terms of where they're going now. It's a completely new direction. Um, they've had off-field problems with their with their sort of uh, chairman, Daniel Kimber, who's been you know, facing accusations of sort of um, off-field issues, financial issues, uh, in terms of the sources of money, of funding for the club, which has also put a bit of a shadow on them slightly. Um, but they've recruited well in terms of they've got David Webb, who is uh, their technical director. He's been at Spurs and he's been at Bournemouth as well. So he's a shrewd operator. He's got a good eye for a, a player. And that leads me on to their sort of recruitment because it's really, really fascinating. And I think they'll be a really interesting team to watch. And I'm, I can't wait to watch them, actually. But the likes of players like Ravel Morrison, um, they've got players like Juno Baptiste, who's uh, come from Crystal Palace, who was prolific uh, at youth level. And I'm keen to see how he does. Um, just to give a bit of insight to maybe listeners who don't know, David Webb is sort of put down as a, the, the, the man who discovered Wilfried Zaha. And so when you see a player like Baptiste, who was at Palace coming in, uh, also Charlie Colkett, who was uh, at Chelsea's academy, um, they've got quite a lot of players that sort of, will be intriguing to watch. But my worry about Ossus is they've also lost quite a few players who were solid, solid players under Potter. And so I just wonder if that will catch up with them and how well can these new players um, gel? Yeah, I mean, how big a year is this for Ian Birchnell? Because he comes in to replace Graham Potter. And really, that was Graham Potter's side, wasn't it? And um, But now we're in a situation where, you know, we've had a whole winter and Birchnell... You know, obviously, is the jury still out on Ian Birchon a little bit? Because now it's going to be his team for a full year. Definitely. Yeah. I think, I think, the, jury, I think the jury is still out um, from the club's point of view, simply because, I mean, they've got faith in him. And I do think he's done well so far. I don't think he's, you know, you can't criticise him because Potter is basically the Alex Ferguson of, 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 um, of Ossesons. You know, so it's it, in that sense you could compare Birchnell to David Moyes, and he's not done any. He's not done worse than Moyes, that's for sure. You know, he's he's steadied the ship. I think they've done quite well. I think they've kind of solidified themselves, and they've gone now in a new direction. They're looking to integrate new players. Um, but the question, you know, in terms of the club, Daniel Kinberg is massively ambitious. He said to Graham Potter, he wanted them to win the title uh, within a couple of years. So they did have that intense drive and, and, and desire to sort of um, push on. So it's not the sort of club that will just be content with mid-table, you know, for the next five years type thing. So there will be kind of that internal pressure to a, to a certain extent. And I think that will also come from um, Ian himself. I think he's an ambitious coach. I think everyone at the club wants to progress. Uh, Sean as well, who we know, I think, you know, they're, they're the kind of people who they're not going to just be sitting around to, to take part. So I think they will want to do well for themselves. The question I have, Steve, is like I say, I mean, for number one, Ossesons are not the most massively supported team in the league. You know, they, they, they're kind of an organic uh, project, really, up there in the north. So they've had that fairy tale. They've been to like Arsenal. They've, they've you know, it's a they've had a, a really lo um, romantic period. And this is maybe the not necessarily the come down, but it's the new phase. It's a new chapter, completely new era. The other thing I just wanted to say is that obviously 
a key a key aspect of this is going to be Ravel Morrison. Um, now he was called within the sort of um, corridors of Manchester United. He was described as the best player to ever come from the academy, or one of the best players to ever come from the academy. Ferguson actually said that he was better than Giggs and anyone like that at that, that age. Um, he massively rated Morrison, but the problem was off field. He was surrounded by maybe the wrong people. He's never quite just had that focus. You need to be a sort of Manchester United player. Um, but I have heard like reports from even as he's been in Austin that he's just his ability is second to none um, and remains second to none. He's only there till June, so that's a bit of a worry. You know, like if he does unbelievably well, will they be able to keep him? Can he keep his focus? He's had so many different clubs. He's almost becoming a journeyman now. But on his day, Ravel Morrison, I, I, I'll never forget one game. Uh, I was at West Ham Man City. Uh, I was there watching it, reporting from the press box. And um, he ripped apart Man City that day. And this is the Man City of sort of Aguero. This is the Man City of Silva. And I remember that game really, really vividly. He was so good. Um, and I thought to myself, he'll play for England. But, you know, he fell out with Sam Allardyce and there's rumours behind that. And it never quite worked out for him at that point. And it was a real shame for him because I think he could have established himself in the Premier League at that point. But um, there's no doubt in his ability. He's a fantastic player. And he, for me, he could be the best player in the league. Mm. I, I think there's a lot of very exciting... Um, I think there'll be a good team to watch, Ossersons, to be honest. A lot of intrigue there from... Uh, from a neutral perspective, and uh, I, I wish them well. Um, I would just personally like to wish, um, I say, Ian Birchall and Sean Costable the very best for this season. Two fantastic guys, and I really hope it works out for them. I think they play, try and play football in the right way. And uh, I say, personally, from me, I'd like to say yeah, good luck. You think uh, you're predicting them for seventh this season? Um, yeah. I'd also, by the way, they've lost Douglas Burke this recently to Halverson uh, since we recorded the last pod, and he, he's going to be a good signing for Halverson. OK, so um, I'm actually going to talk about a couple of other sides before the side uh, you're predicting for eighth. Uh, Helsingborg are back in the league, a newly promoted side, a big club in uh, Sweden. And uh, I was reading a few tweets about them. I mean, the expectation is that they come straight into the league and not going to be in any relegation trouble and probably going to be fighting in the top half of the table. And, and you see it that way as well, John. But I think Helsingborg will establish themselves I don't really personally expect them to uh, sort of be in relegation trouble. I look at them, they're an established team. They're a good squad. They've got good players. Um, did well last season. And yeah, I think they've got quite, they've got some exciting recruitment as well, actually. So, Who are the key players? Well, I mean, the main man is Andreas Granqvist, who is obviously a bit of a Swedish legend, uh, captain of the national team. You know, a real kind of Swedish hero, to be honest. He was really good in the World Cup. Um, obviously, there was the whole thing about his wife's pregnancy and him playing and all that. And he, 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 was, he won the hearts of the nation, really. Um, he's their main man. So, you know, Granqvist is, is obviously going to be... And, and actually, at this level, he can still do a job, that's for sure. He's a, bit, he's a little bit older now, but there's, there's no doubt he can do a job. Um, I like, actually, some of their recruitment, which I'll come on to. I think I've named a couple of them in my attempt to watch. Yeah. Probably going to talk a bit more about Helsingborg later. Um, but just finally, before we move on, the sheer size of the club, good to have them back in the Asvenskan? Uh, most definitely. I think, well, my last memory of Helsingborg was watching uh, three of their, masks, uh, their fans wearing screen masks, running onto the pitch and attacking Jordan Larson and, and uh, trying to rip off his shirt. Um, it was actually quite a harrowing scene to watch, to be honest, and uh, it was quite scary because of the way they assaulted him. It, you know, anything could have happened. Um, those scenes were on the backdrop of them getting relegated, obviously, in uh, 2017. And, yeah, the fans were not happy about that whatsoever. They're a well-supported club. Even in the Super Retin, I've seen games where they, they played and they brought a lot of fans. Um, they, will, they will add something to the Svensk camp, certainly, as, as a club in general. Obviously, they won the Super Wrestling last season. They won the league, uh, scoring 59 goals and conceding 30. Only lost three games. So, you know, it's good to have their back, I think, to be honest. OK, uh, so you predicted them ninth. Uh, Gif Sundsvall in eighth. Just quickly on uh, Gif here. Um, you quite like them as a side, don't you? And you, you, you think they're going to stay in that, uh, in that top half of the table? Yeah, certainly. I mean, uh, Gif Sundsvall for me were... They only finished eighth last season, but for me, they were like the best team to 
one of the best teams to watch without any shadow of doubt. An interesting factor in this is they've lost one of their main, they had a sort of style of football that was very Spanish. They had a Spanish influence. They recruited met a lot of Spanish influenced players, players like David Batanero, who, by the way, is heavily linked with the uh, move to Oiko, AIK, uh, to replace sort of uh, that, 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 that uh, midfield gap that they've got since uh, Christopher Olsen left. Watch that, watch this space for that one. But yeah, I, I really enjoyed watching Gibson so last year. Uh, and I actually predicted them to do quite badly last season, but they, they really surprised me. But the problem is, they've lost one of those key coaches to EF Core, who had a massive, massive um, drive to sort of bring in those that, that coach um, and try and implement that sort of tiki taka style at IFK Gothenburg. So the question for GIF is, can they retain it? They've obviously got Joel Cedegren, who I think is the longest serving manager in, in, in the league. Um, an experienced manager. They've got quite a good recruitment, like I say, based on that sort of Spanish influence. Um, I, I'm not sure they'll go as well as last season in terms of exciting football, but they 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 still got a good identity. They've still got players like Batanero, Linus Hellenius was the, the league's second top scorer last season and was in the All Svenskan team of the year. I still expect him to go quite well. I think he actually really improved, even though he's slightly older. And this is well, I think again are another team to watch this season and. and I imagine they'll be sort of entertaining, certainly at the start of the season. Yeah, on to Hellenius. Uh, obviously scored 18 uh, goals last year. He's, uh, for fantasy, uh, our Svenskan uh, players out there, he's 10.5 million. Have you got to add him to your team? Who is that, sorry? Hellenius. 10.5 million is quite a lot, to be honest. Mm. But um, yeah, he's a solid performer. I think the supply line will be important. You know, they, they have lost a couple of players. Uh, one of my 10 players to watch is actually Tamimi, Jonathan Tamimi, who's a, a fullback who I think will do well there. And he could be one for your fantasy team in terms of Gif Sundsvall. And I think he could actually end up being a player who gets picked up. He reminds me of Eric Larson, who went to Malmo and he was at Gif Sundsvall as well. And he was a, a solid sort of fullback. Um, I think Tamimi will be similar this season, a 24 year old. But Hilarious, yeah, he could be one for the fantasy team. Um, I'd pick Tamimi, to be honest. Okay, so let's move on to the next team. And, uh, well, last year, probably the big flop in this uh, division was IFK Gothenburg, who finished as low as 11th. I mean, they were shambolic at times, but, um, the gen- well, some of the consensus I saw out there was it was just a bit of a freak year and they're bound to bounce back. But, uh, well, you don't have them to be bouncing back that much more, John. IFK as low as 10th. Um, obviously, you're not high on them at the moment. Well, it's one place higher than last season when they finished 11th. And uh, bear in mind, they were only five points above relegation last season. So, you know, I think they're going to have to take baby steps. They've had a a big sort of internal uh, upheaval behind the scenes. I think they're still looking for a sporting director. They've been looking for him for months now since uh, Matt's Gren left as sort of sporting uh, chief. Um, Like I say, they they, they went all out for this new coach uh, to sort of implement that tiki-taka style. Last year as well, don't forget Poya Asbagi, who was, uh, he was the youngest manager in the league. They went all out for him because they wanted him to bring in his new style of sort of 3-4-3. Three, three. Um, that didn't work and they changed formation quite a lot last season. I don't think, you know, I don't think they've found their way yet. Uh, I think they will eventually, but I think this season, I'd look at them as maybe, they could maybe reach sort of 8th, 7th, but... I, you know, as, as, as it stands, I think there are other teams that maybe they might finish above Gibson's fan, but I'm not sure. You know, essentially, they've tried to steal Gibson's fan style, you could say. Um, <clears throat> the interesting thing to note about EF Core is they actually have the youngest average age in the Old Svenskan. And this is part of a regeneration project that, that they've kind of stated quite publicly. They, they, their aim is to win Old Svenskan within the next sort of two to three or four or five years. And they want to do it with players from their academy. You know, they've got a real focus on their academy. They have a very good academy. Uh, we'll talk about some of their players soon. Um, and they have a drive around that academy. And I think it says a lot that they've got the younger squad. I think they are, like I say, that that's tells you a bit about it. That gives insight into their state of mind right now. I think they're rebuilding. I think they're looking to the future and sort of just re-putting the blocks in place. Because they've had a lot of players come and go as well, like Hammerby. Um been very hard to figure out what they're trying to do with their recruitment over the last few years. It seems to be they throw the baby out with the bathwater, they, they buy a load of players and then they get rid of them as well. So 
I think, but I think they've got some exciting players this season. And it's just about maybe consolidating and then maybe going from forward from there. What would actually be an acceptable finishing position for fans, do you think? Well, I think the fans have high hopes and, and uh, certainly hardcore EF core fans aren't going to be satisfied finishing below Hacken uh, and certainly not 10th. I think a realistic, you know, aim would be top six, really. I think they, you know, EF yeah, core are still a massive club in, in, in Sweden. There's no doubting about that. Uh, but we have to look at the, the, the realist, you know, we have to be slightly realistic about it. The last two seasons have been pretty poor for them and I think they're not totally out of that situation yet I don't think they're still they're still rebuilding that in my opinion um but there's some real positives to look at we'll, we'll talk about our players and our tend to watch but they've got some academy players I really like we'll talk about Benjamin Nygren soon who I've been beating the drum about since he was 16 uh, and he's proven me right already with his, his performances um Kerry Ishvili as well is one we'll talk about but yeah I think they they're showing signs of re-emerging EF Core and uh, although 10th might be a little bit harsh on them I think it wouldn't surprise me if I saw them sort of like seventh, sixth, um, as the season goes on. Okay, we're going to move on to the relegation battle now. And uh, two teams that you've got sort of hovering above that zone, uh, maybe get sucked into it, are Kalmar and Elfsborg. We've got a question from one of our uh, listeners, uh, Varsen, uh, on Twitter, at OscarHult1991, a loyal supporter of the podcast. Thanks very much for your uh, questions over the last year or so. Uh, he says, everyone seems to think that Kalmar will end up worse this year, even though the team is stronger. They've only lost one pre-season game against Malmo. What are your thoughts on Kalmar, Kalmar John? Well, if you look at their season last season, they're a bit of a... And by the way, thanks to Oscar, who's a really loyal supporter. It's a bit of a mishmash when you look at Kalmar's season, really. Uh, it was a big shame that their, their manager had to step down. Uh, due to health reasons mid-season. They then brought in Henrik Riedstrom, whose record red sort of played 15, uh, only won three and picked up 14 points. But they never really looked like they'd go down. They, they, they're they that sort of team, to be honest, Calum. I could see them finishing 11, 12. I don't think they'll be in too much trouble. They, they tend to get one or two signings right, but they're another team who tends to get signings wrong sometimes. I remember they had a lot of random players last season. Um, brothers and sisters and sort of like people with the same name, name things everywhere. And uh, I was quite critical last year of their recruitment. But funnily enough, they started the season really well. They won sort of uh, five of the like, first seven. So um, the first eight, sorry. So they actually started the season pretty, pretty, pretty well on form. But um, from there, it didn't really, didn't really do too well. They, they went on a, a bad run. Reedstrom did okay. There were some calls for him to remain at the end of the season. I think some fans wanted him. They've now got, um, I think, Magnus Pearson, who was at Malmo, and he's got a lot to prove, actually, having been sacked by Malmo. Um, pretty unceremoniously, if you look at it. You know, he kind of left with his tail between his legs at Malmo, as we mentioned earlier, with really bad form. So I think it's a good signing, actually, as a, as a manager of Pearson. I think he will, he's, it's a good club for him, Kalmar. Um, and I think he'll do well to sort of re-establish himself I'm not entirely sure about some of their players that I don't want to comment too much because I don't know some of them, to, I'll be perfectly frank. They, they do tend to have... I'd like to talk to their chief scout, uh, Kalmar. I, I don't understand their recruitment at times. Where do they, where do they get these players from? What's the, what's the, honestly, like they get Brazilians, they get, they get all kinds of players. Um, so I'd like to talk to their sporting director, if I'm perfectly honest. But uh, they're that kind of team. I, I don't fear for them. I think they'll they'll... They'll be sort of solid, mediocre mid-table, to be honest. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I mean, you're right about that. They seem to have players very similar name. It was like a horror movie, wasn't it? Nightmare, Nightmare on Elm Street <laughs> with Kalmar, I do believe. <laughs> Elm, Elm and Elm, yeah. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, yeah, let's get him on. Let's get the Kalmar uh, sporting director on. Um, it be very interesting listening. But mid-table um, for Kalmar and Elfsborg, have you got much to say about them? No, nothing much. A bit of a. I mean, you see them going down, but. <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> Elfsborg. Have we even got one of their players to watch in the uh, ten? I don't think we've even got that, have we? <laughs> no, I mean they've got they've got a couple of players. Um, Pavel Zbitsky, or as I mentioned, he's come from come from Leeds. He absolutely flopped at Leeds. 
I never thought he was going to really make it at least to be honest I found it a weird signing he's quite slow didn't think he would suit the championship and um, with, with all respect to him he didn't suit the championship <clears throat> I think they bought him off one bicycle kick actually for Malmo um, you know yeah, he started the season really well for Malmo that year and, and got his move but they're a weird team they're a weird team I I just, I just they're another one that I wonder about and you know, where they're going um, Dennis Hummets actually could be a good, good signing from Trelleborg. He had a fairly good season. But yeah, just look at it. I, I mean, I don't like to criticise managers, but I, I'm not a man. I, I look at Jimmy Tellin actually was rated as a really exciting young coach. Um, but I look at him, him at, at Yon Shopping, he got them relegated. Uh, they tried to play the sort of enterprising, high pressing style, and it didn't work, and they went down. Uh, he's then got the big break at, at Ellsborg. But, you know, I look at him, and it's a similar thing, really. Didn't see much from the last season. I honestly think you could blink through the whole season and not miss much. 29 goals in 30 games. Um, lost 14 out of 30. I'd like to have seen them gone down, to be honest. I, I don't think they offered anything. Um, they didn't even offer the, the excitement of being terrible. They just offered pure mediocrity. We rarely, rarely talk about them. I think they probably had less airtime on our podcast since we've started doing these than... Well, anyone else in Sweden, certainly. I could probably think maybe odd in Norway. But, yeah, just one of those signs where not an awful lot seems to actually happen with Elfsborg. So let's swift well, move on. No, no, no. Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy Tellin is averaging 1.09 points per match in 33 games at Elfsborg. It's not a good enough total. And I think if it continues, I can see them getting sucked into a relegation battle. But one bright spot for them is I like Maroki Ndioni. I think he's a young player. Uh, from their academy, who I've seen uh, several times, and I, I think he's a really good potential breakout player. Um, they do tend to have a fairly good academy; they're quite well supported. I like the club in general; I like the kit, but I just, you know, they've got to do better for me. Really, they've got to be; they've got to offer more excitement. Jimmy Tellin is the bookmakers' favourites to uh, be first manager sacked this season in the Arsvenskan. Um, just uh, for those out of interest. So maybe, I don't know if you want to back him at uh, odds of just over two to one there, John, but uh, he is, the bookmakers are not expecting him to last that long. Um, okay, this relegation battle then, there's two newly promoted sides, Falkenberg and uh, AFC Eskilstuna, and we've still got two other sides to talk about, Sirius and Urebro. Which two of those do you think is going to go down? To go down, I have the bottom two as... Falkenberg and IK Sirius. Okay, well let's uh, let's start with the Sirius actually because they are on the Alsvenskan side um, previously. Uh, but you think they're going to slip down into that uh, automatic relegation spot? Sirius. Yeah, I do. Yeah, I, I fear for Sirius actually. Um, what are the big problems? Hmm? What are their big problems going to be? Okay, let's talk about Sirius. Um, let's get serious about them. Uh, I've got two things written down for Sirius. Number one is bad recruitment. And number two is injuries. I worry about their general recruitment. I see not much from them. Um, not spent too much, not really invested too much in terms of young talents. They've got a couple of players from Dalkurd, Kevin Cisse, for example, is one you know, that aren't that inspiring. Don't forget, Dalka got relegated last season um, with, you know, 18 defeats. So those kind of players, I'm not entirely sure what what they add. I think they've lost a massive player in Moses Ogbu. Um, and bear in mind, they've lost players now. They're the sort of, they remind me of Southampton um, in, in the Premier League, you know, in the sense of about two years ago, they had quite a lot of good players. Uh, and we're doing well, and they've just seemed to the recruitment just seems to have not really improved. And Kim Bergstrand did a fantastic job. Don't forget, at one point in not the season just gone, the season before that, they were they were they were third, and they were newly promoted at that point. Uh, they were in the top three. So Kim Bergstrand's earned his move to Eurogarden, but yeah, I just think they they they, they treaded water last year. Thirty points from thirty play. They they were lucky that Trelleborg and Dalka were terrible, um, and they just managed to finish above water in terms of keeping above Bruno Hoikina. Um So, yeah, I think they've lost the key man in Moses Ogbu, and I think he was the captain as well. So that, that's a massive impact. I think they'll, they'll, they'll miss him. And I just don't see anything in terms of, in terms of recruitment. 
and they tend to pick up a lot of injuries as well, Sirius. And I think they've got a new stadium in, in, the, in the pipeline potentially. But yeah, I worry about them. And I just, like we say, we talked about Henrik Reed's drum at Kalmar. His record is 14 points from 15 games played. You know, I think Bergstrand had a massive impact in, in keeping Sirius up, his managerial capabilities. And, and having lost him as well as Ogbu, I, I do fear for them. OK, well, the bookmakers' favourites to go down are Falkenberg, um, uh, or a promoted side. They gained automatic promotion, finished uh, from the Super Retin. Uh, one, point, one to two favourites to go down. I mean, it looks like they are. everyone's expecting them to struggle. Nailed on for relegation, John? I think it's watch the space with Falkenbergs. You know, I think we've seen teams come up like Trelleborg and just really, really struggle. Uh, Falkenberg came second last season in Super Ethan, but they were the top scorers by miles. They actually scored 61 goals in, in 30 games, which is really impressive. The problem there is they've lost their top goal scorer, Chisholm Lake Butchland, who was actually from Hacken. Uh, he's now gone to South Korea. So they've lost him. And, you know, they've got a couple of players there up front who could maybe do one or two things. Simi Sufaj and I think... Um, and Seema Peter as well, who's, who could offer something, but I think they'll struggle out. And I, I just, someone's got to finish bottom, haven't they? Mm. I mean, last year's teams that came up were, were terrible, weren't they? And I know Helsingborg were expected to do uh, an awful lot better, but uh, it's not a great record in recent times, or well, certainly based on last season of, of, of teams coming uh, straight up. So, um, do you see AFC Eskilstuna faring any better? Well, I mean, with Falkenberg, I think they'll give a good go of it. Their first two games are already brought home and then Ostersund's away. So, you know, they need to get out of the blocks kind of flying to really have an impact. AFC Eskilstuna, I'm a bit positive on them just for the fact that they, they're in the cup final. And I think they've shown glimpses there. Obviously, they eliminated the AIK in their own backyard on penalties. Um, you know, albeit on penalties, but that's still impressive, to be honest, to knock out the champions. They're the kind of club that they, they will start the season as the most hated team in the league. They will end the season as the most hated team in the league. But, and probably one of the least supported teams in the league. But there's something about them that, you know, they were very close to staying up in that year under Michael Jolly. And, and they were, you know, they're the kind of team who rec tends to recruit fairly well. And I think they've got a couple of players that, that you know, Remind me of the sort of Edaris and Briatores of, of, of seasons past. Um, and so at the cup final, so it might be the cup final is blinding me a little bit, but I think AFC Eskilstuna could, could do okay. Key players for them this season, who are they going to be? Well, I've got one of the ones to watch actually, and that's Samuel Namani, who's a 23 year old Nigerian. He got 12 goals in the Super Etten last season for them. Uh, and did quite well in the cup as well in certain games. I think he scored against Noor Shopping in the cup uh, early this year. Adi Nalic as well is one from Malmo who's on loan. Malmo signed him and sort of immediately have loaned him out. He's a young player. Uh, could be an interesting one to watch. They had the best defensive record in the Super Etten by miles. They were the AI, a, they were the AIK of the Super Etten actually in second division. They, they conceded 16 goals similar to AIK. Uh, the next closest in that league in terms of goals conceded was 30 goals. So that tells you how good their defensive record was. Um, they've lost a couple of players, but if I look at it, I, th I think sometimes teams who come up tend to have a bit of a, you know, they have a, that momentum behind them. And I think obviously being in a cup final, they'll have a little bit of momentum, which I think will just take them to my predicted position, which is... Um, which is a 13th. You think they're going to avoid any form of uh, potential relegation yeah, 13th or 14th they'll be. So I've gone 13th. Well, the last team we're going to talk about are Urubro, and they were ninth last year. So quite a significant drop in terms of your, your prediction for them to 14th. What is going to cause them to jump down the table so significantly, do you think? Yeah, it's a fascinating one, Steve. And I think whereas you've got teams like, you know, um, teams we talked about, for example, Ellsborg, and maybe even Kalmar, you know, the kind of teams where they're about as joyless as sort of getting a bedtime story read to you by Tony Pulis. Um, Odebrew are quite a fascinating one, and I really worry for Odebrew. And obviously we had Axel Kjall on the podcast last season, and he's an exciting young manager, I think. I think he's, 
he is potentially going places. And I, I asked myself how long he'll stick around, actually, because I, I, I fear for Audible. And let me just read you a couple of statistics, uh, Steve. So if you actually look at their league position last season, they, 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 made, made, they managed 35 points and they scored 34 goals. That got them a solid sort of ninth place. They were never really in any doubt in terms of going down. They were just a solid mid-table team. However, towards the end of the season, they lost three of their last four games, and they, they really started to plummet. The other thing with them, Steve, is they have lost two players who make up collectively 41% of their goals last season. Wow. That's Kennedy, Igbo, and Anike, who scored nine goals in 24 games, and Nahir Basara, who I named as one of my 10 to watch last season. Uh, who's now gone off to um, the Middle East. He got five goals and eight assists, which wasn't as good as maybe some people predicted, but he's still a key, key, key player for them. Those two players together contributed 41% of their goals. Now, take that away. To me, I calculate that as, say, eight points. Now, if you take eight points off their 35 points from last season, that is pretty much just above relegation last year. It's not only that. They've got an ageing squad slightly. I think they've lost other players in there haven't really replaced them. So, yeah, I do really worry for Oribor, to be honest. And it might be a little bit egging the pudding slightly to say they'll finish bottom three, but I think they're going to struggle. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to see they're three to one to be directly relegated. And they, well, maybe that's where there's a little bit of value in the relegation uh, betting market there for Oribor. You're predicting them 14th. Watch out for them to... Um, potentially go downhill a little bit certainly uh, significant losses there. I always remember that Ken, uh, Igbo and Ike in, uh, he was another flop in MLS for Chicago Fire what is it about certain some of these Ausfenskan players who struggle in MLS John I don't know but um, okay well this is the you pre final prediction in the table then uh, we've done the top six so you were predicting Ossesund 7th Giftsundsvall 8th Helsingborg 9th EFK Otterborg 10th Kalmar 11th, Elfsborg 12th, AFC Eskel Student 13th, Urebro 14th, Sirius 15th, Falkenberg 16th. Okay. Um, let's move on to 10 players to watch. I know you really enjoyed this part, John, so uh, take it away. Who are your 10 for 2019? You want to name them or shall I? You name them. Okay. So, yeah, and I think we're going to come back to Helsingborg in this bit because I didn't quite get to say everything I wanted to about them. And they have two players in this list. So I'm going to name them all now. I'm going to go through them for you. My 10 to watch for 2019 season, Steve. Ravel Morrison, quite a predictable one, really. Osterson, Romain Gaul, Noel Umbo of Helsingborgs. Is a young striker from Gillingham uh, who Helsingborg was picked up and I think is an interesting signing. <clears throat> Giorgio Kiriishvili from EFK Yotaborg, who managed, as I mentioned before, I think nine goals and four assists in 27 games last season in his breakout season, his first year in Sweden. Really impressive. Vidar Kiartansson from Hammerby. Kunyai Bendu, who's another one uh, from Helsingborg. He's uh, a loan player, I believe, and he's been at Celtic. He's on loan from Celtic. Odilon Kosanu from Hammerby. He's a young 18-year-old centre-back who's an absolute beast. And I think Hammerby have really guarded him and hanging hang on to him because they've had interest from other clubs. Um, and they've been straight in there when he turns 18 and giving him a contract. And I think he's one to watch. Benjamin Nigren, as I mentioned, the youngster, the teenager at EFK Jotterburg. Samuel Namani uh, from AFC Oskarstuna. And as I said before, Jonathan Tamimi from GIF Sundsvall. Okay, well, we mentioned uh, we were going to talk about Helsingborg a bit more in this section. So you've got two players uh, from them to watch out for, Noel and Bo and uh, Kunyai Bendu. So let's tell us a bit more about, uh, about those two guys. Yeah, well, Noel Limbo is a player who I think was a little bit unlucky at Gillingham. I don't think he had the run of the green there. Um, I've heard of actually stories behind the scenes that uh, are slightly unsavoury as to why he left. I think I believe the manager um, takes a bit of criticism for that that hasn't come out yet and things may come out in the future. Um, but I can't say too much on that. But in general, Noel Limbo is a youngster. He's uh, 
21 years old, uh, sorry, 19 years old. Um, and he's the kind of player that I think, I, I mean, he's been at Charlton's Academy, Gillingham's Academy. He's a sort of physical player, quite quick. He went on trial there. He wasn't really getting in the team at Gillingham and uh, was given a trial and, and impressed enough to get the contract. To me, he's the kind of player who could go well in the offense again. I think he's, he's, his, his game could be suited to that league. So, you know, it's a speculative one, I'll be honest, and I might, I might be wrong on it. He might be a bit young, but he's the kind of player I look at who has the profile to maybe uh, in, do quite well in Sweden, I think, especially a team with relatively low expectations in terms of, you know, if he gets 10 goals, that's a massive achievement, and I think he could aim for that. So he's one of mine. Could I have been you as well? I mean, he's, he's actually been quite highly rated over the past, but has never really seemed to do it. Uh, he was at Celtic for a while and hasn't, you know, quite cut it there. But um, I think he's just one of those players that I like the look of. And, and when he comes, when you get, you know, players with technique and something a little bit different about them, when they come to Sweden, they can tend to do quite well. And I think Ben Yu offers that. So I think it'll be interesting to watch. The next player I'm going to ask you about, and I can never resist a young central defender um, with great potential. And I, I do like the sound of this uh, Odilon uh, Kosanu at Hammerby. What skills do you think he has got that can sort of make, I mean, make a real impact in this league at, at such a young age? Well, I think Odilon Kostin is the sort of player who, within a few weeks, he'll be in everyone's fantasy team, um, depending on how Hammerby go. He is a player, as I mentioned, I think he's been with the club for more than a year, actually, Hammerby, but he's been unable to get uh, work permits and been unable to get kind of um, you know, he's, he's under 18, so he hasn't been able to be signed. But he's had interest from a lot of other clubs. Uh, like I say, he's a, a real f sort of tall, physical athlete of a player. Um, the quote from the sporting manager of uh, Hammerby, Jesper Janssen, was that we have massive hopes for him. They really seem to rate this player. Um, just to give you a quote from the, that Janssen, he said, he has all the conditions, physically, technically, and in terms of game understanding, to go really far. Even if he is only 18, he will compete to a great extent from day one for a place in our team. He's been with the club since 2016, as I mentioned. Um, he described it as a dream come true. And he's had real interest from other clubs around Europe. And I just think he's the kind of player that if he goes into that team and does well after a season, Hammerby aren't afraid of selling a player. And you could see him move on to a bigger league for sure. Uh, and I'm just really excited to watch him play, I'll be honest. Stick with Hammerby and Vidar Kjartansson, uh, striker. He's actually the most valuable player in the league, according to Transfer Mart, at two and a half million euros. Um, obviously, I'm familiar with him myself. He had a fantastic year at Volarenga about five years ago. He scored nearly 30 goals, incredibly. Um, wherever he goes, he scores. A huge amount um, of goals, it seems. Uh, you mentioned him in the league. He's only here till the, middle, till the summer, potentially. But, uh, I mean, how many can he bag for Hammerby, do you think? Well, he scored 14 goals in 19 games for Malmo when he was there. Uh, and there was then sort of, he's, he's moved on to Rostov in Russia. And it's like I said, it is, and I could see this happening to Christopher Olsen in, in, in Krasnodar. You know, I could see him getting there, not doing too much and, and coming back, like I say. Um, 14 goals in 19 games at Malmö was an unbelievable record, uh, which tells you a little about, about his worth. And just pottering around in Russia is a bit of a waste of his time. So coming back, I think that's a, that's a huge loan signing. Um, he'll be one to watch, and I think he's the sort of player, again, if you're looking at fantasy football, he's one to put in your team because I think he could, if he gets back to that form, he is comfortably able at this level uh, and could bag a lot of goals, actually. They've got Nikola Jurgic as well still, um, but I think Kjartinson has the potential to do very well. And we'll do a couple more about this, this list then and move on then to some, uh, some list of questions. Uh, Roman Gall at Malmo, because, uh, I mean, if they're going to have a big year, he's going to be one to contribute massively. Yeah, I think it's. Um, I didn't have him in my team last season to watch, uh, so I'm kind of a bit late on this one, maybe to a certain extent. I wanted to see how he did at GIF, 
in that second year because he was a bit of he was a bit inconsistent um, the season before that. But but he's fully deserved his, uh, his place. He did really well first half of the season um, before getting his move. I remember one game last season where he uh, scored an unbelievable goal against EFK Jotterburg and really showed good signs. Kind of almost uh, like a sort of comparison would be sort of maybe Leroy Sane of this league uh, in style and kind of impact. Um, you know, not quite as good, of course, but but similar kind of um, technical profile, maybe um, uh, maybe a slightly lower level. He's a United States international, uh, and like I, I mean, like I say, I expect him to be in a position to maybe move by the end of the season um, to a bigger club. I think he's really um, coming on. He's got 15 goals now in 49 all Spence game games, nine assists, and he just seems to be getting better and better, Steve. And also, by the way, he's still quite young. He's only 24, so he's got room for improvement and development. Let's finish off by talking about uh, IFK Yotaborg. Then you've got a couple of guys on this list. Uh, Kiriash Vili, who you talked about a little bit earlier, and uh, the young uh, striker, Benjamin Nigeran. So uh, he, he excites you, doesn't he? Yes, he's a player who's excited me since I saw it. I've seen him at academy level um, at 16, I think. Um, and from day one, I, I really thought this, I mean, technically he's, he's very, very gifted. Uh, I can see him growing into his frame and, and sort of um, becoming more physically imposing. He's still a teenager, still a boy basically at the moment, but he's massively talented. Um, he had trials at Brighton when he was younger. There's now rumours that Manchester City are looking at him. Uh, he came in and scored some quality goals. He was basically, he of course, season was a write-off. And as soon as they won... Uh, at Bromer Poik in the last year to sort of cement themselves from getting relegated. Um, they threw in more more younger players and he was one of them. Uh, and it didn't go too well for them until the last game of the season. And yeah, Benjamin Eagle came in and scored two goals, uh, which is just you know really, really impressive for someone who is so young. Um, so yeah, he's, he's got two goals in three Ospens games already uh, at just 17 years old. And I, I don't think they'll be afraid to actually play him um, in the first team from day one. So I kind of look at him and I think sometimes he reminds me a little bit of Teddy Sheringham when I, you know, in terms of style-wise. And he's also very good in the air. And Sheringham was quite good in the air, actually. But um, definitely one to watch. He, he will end up in a bigger league without any question. Remember the name, Benjamin Nigren. Uh, I just want to go back to Roman Gaul again. Uh, John, if you don't mind, because there was a question uh, on Twitter from Joe Gold. Uh, thanks for the question, Joe. Does uh, Gaul lock down a spot in the Malmo starting 11? Funnily enough, good question, Joe. And the answer is no. I was at Stamford Bridge fully expecting him to, to play against uh, Chelsea. Um, for Malmo, and I thought he would be. He's the. I mentioned at the start of this podcast that Malmo lacked that kind of player who can unlock the door, that 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 creative wild card. And for me, Romain Gaul is that man. So I was surprised that Veros didn't play him in that game, especially when they needed goals. Um, but yeah, it's um, one of those. He's not guaranteed. I think Rosler likes to rotate. I think Rosler likes solid players, but Gaul has the quality really, and and. I'd be very surprised if he's not a regular starter from maybe, you know, mid-season at least or early early point, you know, let's say five, six games in. From then on, he's, he should establish himself. Okay, some more questions then from uh, Twitter. I don't want to forget about um, some of the other 10 to watch we're not going to be able to talk about. Jonathan Tamimi at uh, GIF, Samuel uh, Namani at AFC Eskil Stuna, but uh, Ravel Morrison's on this uh, list as well, uh, John. And this question we've had from... Uh, for life, uh, Uyen, um, is asked as he's joining the Asvenskan fantasy again this season. Have you got any hot inside tips on who looks sharp in Ostersund at the moment for fantasy football? Yes, a lot of people I've seen have put Dino as Islamovic in their team up front, but for me, he's a little bit inconsistent, so I, I'd stay away from him for a few games. I haven't looked at their fixtures, so it's hard to comment, but you'd be hard-pressed to look beyond Ravel Morrison, for one. Uh, Charlie Cocker's the midfielder, so it's, you know, you, you're not quite sure in that sense. 
let me think about this a bit more. Mm, yes. I, I'll have to come back to you on that one. I, I might tweet, I might follow us at Nordic Foot Pod and I'll tweet something before the weekend. And um, we've also got a question from Jurgen Hernholm. Um, he also asked about uh, how he thought, how he thought uh, uh, Hjartan, the uh, Icelandic uh, Hjartan somebody, I'm going to cut this yeah, Yes, would perform in Hammerby. Hopefully, um, you answered his question there by when we talked about him. But also, he wants to know who you think will win the golden boot in the Alsvenskan for 2019. Very good question, Jorgen. Instinctively, my gut says, if you're looking for a value bet, Puyatore. If you're looking for a predictable bet, Paulinho. And if you're looking for maybe a bit of an outside bet, tough one, really. Mm. Yeah, so... If, 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 if Kjart Tenson extends his loan, he's got the ability. Um, so, yeah, I would I would, I would, would say Piotr is my outside bet, I'll be honest. And finally, um, we've got a question from a, a real legend of one of our followers. Salola Olamide, who um, was in contact last year with us a few times. Um, thank you very much for your question, Salola. And he's asking both of us, actually, please, can you can I have your predictions for the opening week, both in Norway and Sweden? So have you got a couple of um, predictions for the opening round that Salola could, uh, could have from you, John? OK, I haven't really properly looked at the opening round, but predictions... I'm just going to make one, I think. And I'm going to say, mm, let me look at this. Let me think about this a little bit. The big game is Malmo against Hacken, by the way. That's going to be a great game on Monday. But I'm going to go Kalmar to beat Sirius. There you go. 1.75, you can get it. And uh, Salola, my tip in Norway is Valerenga to beat Mjørndalen, by the way. So thanks very much for your tweet at us okay well i think that's about it john it's been a mammoth podcast hasn't it um uh, absolute uh well huge one uh hope uh hope all the listeners enjoyed it and can i mean there's some great insight here into the us uh, renskin this season um, before we go a couple of things don't forget to follow us on twitter nor at nordic Footpod, and like us on facebook we had a couple of likes uh, after last week's show for Norway, so I'm glad someone actually listened to that call to action and and, and did it. Um, please continue to like us on Facebook because we will be more active there. But also Twitter is our main our main base at Nordic Footpod. And the other thing to point out is we will be having fantasy league teams this season. So we will tweet out the code. We will tweet out the um, links, and we will be choosing our teams in the next day or so. Steve, we've got reputations to live up to. So, uh, yeah, all you people who listen to us because of the fantasy football, welcome. And we are going to be giving you some great insights. So don't tell all. Maybe do tell your friends, but you might want to keep it under wraps from maybe now and see how we get on. But, uh, yeah, welcome. And we will be commenting a lot on fantasy football as the season goes on. So subscribe as well to the podcast. Uh, we're going to be on Spotify soon. And keep giving us your support. We're also on Patreon. Patreon.com slash Nordic Football Podcast if you would like to financially support us and if we get enough support we will be doing a bonus show this season um and we'll have more details on that it will be betting and fantasy football related but that depends on your support well i'll say thanks very much john for that uh, fantastic show and we'll see you all again uh next week hopefully uh very soon um but it's goodbye from me uh, and take care everyone goodbye